Well, we're going to move on now to our next um, set of speakers. We're super excited. We've got this whole crowd here from Parkland School Districts. We're super excited to have them. And you guys are going to talk about 21st Century Classroom at Parkland. So we have Tracy Smith, J.R. Renna, Sam Edwards, and Lauren Will. Um, who wants to go first? How big is your district? We have uh, about 9,500 students across 12 buildings in the district and um, about 1,500 staff. So on the medium to larger size, uh, as far as Pennsylvania goes. And are you, uh, JR and, and uh, Sam and Lauren, are you assigned across multiple buildings then from a central location? Yep. So, um, Sam is point uh, integration specialist at the middle schools. Uh, Lauren uh, is the point at the high school, one, one high school, two middle schools. And then um, I'm at the district office and uh, can be anywhere at any time. Although mostly that's virtual these days. Yeah, so your virtual rovers or physical rovers as, as needs happen. Do you help them beyond tech integration on the curriculum map of all the things that go into everything? You know, um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that um, we do a lot, and you'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of this in the, the slides with our uh, teacher leaders in the buildings, our tech mentors, um, who help us sort of bridge the gap and make those connections. Um, and then uh, myself and Tracy work collaboratively with the curriculum department and the student services department to um, make those connections and uh, we have like an approach called an interdepartmental approach uh, where technology student services and uh, curriculum meet monthly so that uh, we're all up to speed on the, the others uh, you know we let we let the curriculum lead and then follow along with whatever technology supports the curriculum there well awesome sounds like a good working team well good well i think we have tracy here hi tracy so we were just chatting up about your district size and kind of what's the roles of everybody so why don't you take it away Our, and you can share screen as well if you want to have at it we're super excited to have you well thank you for the opportunity we are excited to be here and uh I did want to start by introducing the team. Um, we have with us J.R. Renna. He's our coordinator of educational technology. We have Lauren Will. She's the technology integration specialist for the high school level. And then we also have Sam Edwards, who's the technology integration specialist for the middle school level. And so um, we do work as a team. And so we're going to be sharing Parkland's story about how we've kind of navigated um, challenging year, to say the least. And we also want to learn from other districts that might be participating about how they weathered this storm and, and maybe you know, share some of the uh, information, the wealth of knowledge that's on this call right now. Um, so with that, I... Okay, how's, can you see it in present mode now? Yep, yes. you're great. Okay, perfect. Lovely. Thanks. Well, okay, so I think we're good. So um, <laughs> just to kick it off, we wanted to do something uh, just to kind of find out where other districts are and in their beliefs in the role of technology in the classroom. Um, we started back in 2015 trying to define our why before we did our one-to-one -one rollout and it was super helpful. Uh, and we're gonna share our story, but we also were interested just in finding out a little bit about the people on the call. And so what I'm gonna do is put in the chat a link. Uh, oh, I got it. You got it? Okay, yep. I'll just put that in there. And it's just a Nearpod Collaborate board. And if you could just uh, share why you're using technology in the classroom, what's kind of the role that you believe is most impactful, that would be great. And that will get us off to a great start. And what you're looking at is word art. <laughs> this is truly uh, very simple, um, but it was powerful. It's, and it's actually been something we refer to quite often when we talk about what we call Park from Ready 21. Um, it's more than just our one-to-one -one technology initiative. It's really about transforming the classroom environment and changing in, uh, the, the pedagogy of our teachers, which is hard. Uh, we worked with a consultant, we worked with the one-to-one -one institute, and they actually said that changing pedagogy is akin to changing religion. It's deep. And so when you wanna make this shift to what we want on the right, which is a highly invested uh, personalized learning classroom, that is hard work and it doesn't happen overnight. And you know, after six years of doing this, I think all of us could say that we're not, you know, 100% there either, but we definitely made inroads in getting to our vision of what we would like to see 
education be? Um, it started by the easy part, defining on the left what we didn't want, which was you know straight lecture, disengagement. That guy from Ferris Bueller has been kind of our icon for, for what we don't want in the classroom. And then along the way, making that shift to a more student-centered environment focused on learning, not just on the teaching, but the learning process, and really making it about uh, metacognition, the learning process, getting students more excited about learning uh, when they leave Parkland than when they come in as kindergartners, which is a high bar. Um, but that was what we um, kind of staked our claim. If we're going to use technology, we want it to be purposeful. We want it to have an impact. And uh, then, of course, at the end of the day, it's all about building relationships and trust because nothing happens, especially change, without having those relationships. And is there anything else that the team would like to add about this? I think just noting the fact that, you know, we were very, very careful and specific about not writing out uh, one word in there. And, and uh, because of the, the timing, we, we won't spend a ton of time on it. But technology, you don't see technology anywhere on this continuum. And as uh, Tracy said before, it's all about the building relationships and the trust. And I, you'll see as we, you know, progress through, you know, the transitions that we've made over the last year and a half year, you know, we're going to see that, you know, having those relationships established with our teachers and with our students um, has led to some success. Thanks, Sam. That's a great, a great point. So um, this is what I did. I put together in word art. Um, now let's take a look at this same kind of vision, how it's evolved. And this was created by one of our students. Um, and you can see that these have become like our five pillars, um, fostering learner-centered classrooms, supporting student voice and choice, providing authentic projects, building 21st century skills, and creating upstanding digital citizens. And everything that we do, we try to go back to one of those five pillars and make sure that we're connecting back to our original vision. So looking at um, that bit about authentic opportunities, uh, really connecting our students with what they're going to need to thrive in, uh, boy, uh, even just reflecting over the past year, some of the things like cognitive flexibility that shows up on this list uh, on the increase, right? Emotional intelligence, things that are, um, making kids into self-starters rather than shifting them from the uh, instructional approach of sort of like the assembly line uh, into something that's more of like a, a autonomous and flexible. Uh, something that you do see as increasing are the things that are uniquely human that are difficult to automate. Um, and I think that uh, when students have those opportunities to do uh, things authentic connected to the community, uh, you find that they go to the end of that chart that Tracy just showed, where they go beyond um, uh, in, in engaged to invested, right? Uh, next slide shows an example of one of those kiddos, uh, Ariman Kandawal, excellent, excellent student that um, got into, um, you know, the concerns of uh, public health and actually as a high school sophomore, uh, was a successful uh, grant recipient to get his app, which shortened uh, positive health outcomes for folks in a rural area with no internet, rural India, uh, from three weeks to something more like three days. So if you think about um, when I when I met uh, Ariman, it was right when my first daughter was born, and I had just gone through this whole barrage of tests. Can can our daughter see? Can she hear? Does she have Billy Rubin? All of these different tests, like those things take a long time um, based on the, the conditions on the ground in India. And Ariman's app was uh, something that he wasn't in, in theory doing. He was like literally getting out on the ground through uh, this Penn State Lehigh Valley launch box program to put the app into action and making positive outcomes. He did that when he was a sophomore. It's a very great uh, uh, kiddo. Um, another one uh, that I like to talk about is Maya Rogers. So, um, you know, our art teachers got iPads with Apple Pencil uh, when those sort of became available. And Maya um, just happened to chime in. I was uh, asking our Trojan tech team, our student-led tech team, does anybody uh, do, do much with art? And Maya's like, yeah, sure, I do. And Ma Maya uh, ended up on the left. You see her teaching our art uh, teachers how to use the iPad with Apple Pencil. Um, so giving her the ability to teach our teachers uh, is a great authentic opportunity. And then um, she went on to intern with the, uh, the, the uh, communications department and do that student calendar there. 
you know, student agency has been extremely important for us to focus on and, and really allowing teachers. And I think now that teachers have kind of taken us, you know, a step back and instead of being that um, sage and stage, instead of being right up front and lecturing all the time, that Ferris Bueller, um, they're finally seeing that, you know, they have the opportunity to let go of a little bit of control. And when we allow students that opportunity to have those authentic experiences, you see so much growth. Uh, Girls Who Code, um, we had a student, Uma Pirani, and she approached myself and Tracy and she had said, listen, I, I want a space for girls to be able to feel confident and to be able to get excited about coding. Can we create that space? And we said, well, what are you, what are you thinking? And so she said, well, you know, girls who code, they have a program. And, and all we said was, sure. And she and a couple of her partners, they, they teamed up and they've, they've built this program up that it's not just about coding anymore. It's about giving back to the community. They've, um, as you see here, different types of projects and events. You know, they do Chromebook. They did Chromebook training. They present at conferences. Uh, they present at all the different types of uh, events that we have. We're always tapping on them. And the funny thing about this is it's not like they're, you know, overwhelmed by anything. And, and they go and they make it do a presentation for us and they circle back. And instead of us saying, you know, thank you so much for, for what you're doing, they say, you know, thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. And we're giving them that opportunity to get up there, to be confident in themselves and to be delivering some of these messages. We had them create uh, technology tutorials because we create them on the teacher side, but teachers need students to be able to see, well, what does it look like from a student perspective? And so instead of us impersonating students, we tapped on them and they've created uh, Schoology tutorials based off of every, anything you can imagine they've created these tutorials and we share those out to the students and especially new students coming on board. It's super helpful. We just share out that slide deck and, uh, and they're ready to go. So we're, we're super proud of our, our students, our girls who code leaders, they've created courses right now. They're working on a club and they have, you know, about a hundred kids signed up and we had to actually close off the, the registration because we didn't want to overwhelm them too much, but they, took those students and now what they do every single Wednesday for an hour is they personalize instruction and they have three other students, uh, three leaders, and they break up all the students and they put them into personalized learning groups and they are teaching them Python. They're teaching them, you know, how to build chatbots and apps and things like that. Tracy and I, we, we sign on and sometimes I, I just sit back and I, I'm, my mind is, is blown by the talent that we have in front of us. But if we didn't give them opportunity to, to get on that stage and to, show us what they can do, you know, they, they would have just stayed back. And, and I think that's key here is giving students the opportunity to have a voice and have a choice in their learning. Other opportunities that we're doing with the uh, student-led tech teams I mentioned before, those Trojan tech teams, that starts in fourth and fifth grade. Uh, one of the most fun things that, that I get to do in my role here. Um, typically those kiddos would get together four from each school, uh, all in the same room and do some digital storytelling things with, uh, pad casters and, um, you know, as a, one of the many things, um, that we've pivoted to, I know it pains me to hear that word pivot because we were so, uh, tired of pivoting, but, um, I'm, I'm so proud of our, our kiddos that did the, um, uh, we brought that experience digitally uh, as like an hour of code activity or um, breakout EDU activities where we have about a hundred fourth and fifth graders in uh, Google meet together, which is a blast. And I learned all of their pets names in the chat. And um, you know, it's an important thing to keep that uh, connection and engagement uh, that that's uh, through the extracurricular bit that we do with Trojan tech team. Um, problem solving skills, really great example there with the breakout EDU stuff. Uh, we also talked about building relationships, not only with our students, but with our teachers. So we're going to show you how we did that with our students, especially the virtual students. We tried something new with badging. So several of our teachers have jumped on this bandwagon and have really gotten into using the badges within Schoology and awarding them to students for certain instances. The picture here is from um, an art teacher who created her own badges. So you can use ones that are pre-created or create your own. And she just kind of went to town with these particular badges. We also build relationships um, through our SWIBS program, school-wide uh, positive behavior programs, so we work on that. We also build relationships through updates that we send in Schoology, uh, regardless of the grade level. So elementary through secondary, we'll throw things out there that are important to all of the students within that particular building. 
the example that you see here um, is reading. Even though we would be virtual, we would have teachers read to the students. Um, a high school example would be something like, hey, let's do, um, let's focus on career exploration and let's give you some ideas for possible scholarships that might be out there. Middle school example might be, hey, for um, this particular day, it's going to be uh, wear a silly hat day and let's talk about um, a partic particular character that you might become. Yeah, especially important because the morning announcements are not something that our online students not, might be checking in with. So keeping that news feed live. So like we said, we're interested in learning more about the participating districts and what you're doing to foster a learner-centered environment. Um, so we're going to try to, I think, just keep it simple. And maybe in the chat, if you don't mind sharing some of the things that you do in your district, maybe introduce yourselves. We'd love to learn what others are doing. That's, that's really a big part of why we like to participate in these types of conferences. Uh, we've shared a little bit about what we've done and I put our, our presentation today in the chat, but we'd love to hear from you as well. So the next piece of our presentation is the what, um, how we kind of got to this point, but we would love to hear more about your vision. Uh, you know, are you uh, in sync with what, you know, kind of Parkland's vision is? Are you doing something different? Um, that's how we grow. Um, we'd like to say the smartest person in the room is the room. So please uh, don't be shy and feel free to share some of the, the things that you're doing that are great in your school district. And with that, I'll move on to the next slide. So JR is gonna talk a little bit about our digital ecosystem, which we talk about clearing the brush for teachers, trying to smooth things out so they have more instructional time. And there's a couple of key things that we've done that have made a difference. Yeah, so absolutely. The um, Clever Portal is really the one-stop shop that all of our uh, students and teachers are accessing on a daily basis. Uh, most of the applications there uh, don't require a login, and if they do require a login, it's just a sign in with Google button. Um, this is, uh, you know, an immensely popular app in K-12 education, but um, our, our teachers know like they go there and it just works. Uh, it's so incredibly helpful to be able to let them focus on their content rather than getting 22 kids logged in, especially when some of them are remote and the others uh, are in the classroom. And, um, you know, some of the key apps that we're using, uh, you saw on that graphic that Tracy showed earlier, uh, formative assessments really important. Um, so, you know, the, the apps that we're using at the elementary level uh, including Nearpod, uh, Seesaw, and Schoology. Uh, this is an overview of those. You want me to play this one? Um, Tracy posted, I posted as well into the chat. You're going to have an opportunity to have the entire presentation. Um, because of timing, we'll, we'll go through, we might play one or two of the videos, but we have a lot of content in there. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of time lot of going into different classrooms and, and capturing that information. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions after watching some of the videos, because it does tell our story um, and it just shows all the different tools that we're using. Hi, I'm Victoria St. George and I am a first grade teacher here at Kernsville right Elementary School. This year I am teaching first grade completely online and I wanted to share with you how the online classroom looks some of the digital resources that have been a great support this year and how our students are still finding success in this unique situation. Some of the many resources I use are Schoology, Nearpod, and Seesaw. Schoology is the main hub for virtual learning in my classroom. Students find their folders for all subject areas here, but the most important tab for students is the daily assignments folder. This shows students and parents the assignments for each day and where to locate them. Some assignments are found on other resources, but Schoology is the starting place each day. Schoology makes it easy to assign, check for completion, and provide feedback. I also love using Schoology for its collaboration opportunities. Here is a student showing her details, and her classmates are accommodating what they believe is the main idea. A fun and engaging way to practice this very important first grade skill. Schoology allows for me to communicate easily with parents with an assignment completion document, weekly schedules, and other important documents such as cover sheets and tutorials. I started using Nearpod last year during spring e-learning and I've continued learning more and more about it. As you can see, I've been able to create a large amount of content for my students, but also have been able to continue collaborating with my colleagues by sharing what I have created as well as having great Nearpod shared with me.
I can provide videos, audio to teach or reinforce a concept asynchronously, as well as give students interactive worksheets, quizzes, an opportunity to type or record their responses. There is so much more I can't wait to explore on Nearpod. Nearpod gives me data to drive my future instruction by showing participation, the breakdown of answers, and specific areas students still need support with. Seesaw is another resource that I use frequently in the online classroom. I am able to create my own interactive worksheets, but also have the availability of community and district shared resources. Students can add more to the interactive worksheets, such as recording responses, uploading content, and asking questions. I like that students can submit work in a way that best works for them. For me, the most important part of this year was to make a classroom still feel exciting, comforting, and provide a sense of belonging. Although our classroom community looks different this year, my students still have their peer interactions during our live instruction all day, opportunities to share with friends, participate frequently, and continue to feel part of a community at Kernsville. Thank you for the resources you have provided for us as we continue navigating this interesting time and providing the best education for each of our students. So you see there that kiddos, even at the uh, primary level, are having an easy job getting into all of their, their apps through Clever. Uh, let's take a look now, Lauren, if you want to set up the secondary. I'm just throwing it up there in the interest of time. Flipgrid is an online application where students can upload video assignments for grading purposes. So it allows them to sing for a grade without me seeing them in person. When I click on an assignment, everything the student needs to complete that assignment is listed there. Students can go in, record their video, edit, do multiple takes until they're happy, and once it's submitted, it's really easy to grade. When I click on a student, I can see their submission. There's a great feedback. Uh, tool here where I've uploaded the rubric, I can grade the student in real time, and within one click, I can email that feedback to the student immediately. It's a great way to navigate singing and choral music in this online world. In foods classes this year, since we have not been cooking or eating in school, we have been able to demonstrate cooking techniques through Edpuzzle videos, uh, which allow the students to see the techniques and check for understanding without actually having to smell the food or be around the food. The first one is a video demonstration on stir fry. Three or four more minutes or until the chicken loses its pinkness. Don't and then you see an example of a multiple choice question and then they could re-watch it if they aren't sure of the answer because this is a learning tool, so they could re-watch it. Then once they hit an answer, then they submit and now that score gets counted. I use Kami as a way to present my material. I present my own notes for the material and I will allow them some room to write down what they would want to. They can always um, open it back up, see what they have, or we maybe we'll continue with it for the next class and everything they had is still saved there. I also rely on Kami a lot for the tests because with physics, a lot of the problems are worth many points and I can give them partial credit. I'd like to see their work. I can grade it then using Kami as well and they get to see my correction. either the live um, Nearpod and I'll have students basically follow along with my presentation and navigate to different websites built into the Nearpod. I'll have questions, activities. There's so many features with Nearpod. And what I find is extremely important from a teaching standpoint is the formative assessment. So after the lesson or even really during the lesson, I can um, access the results to see who is participating. Um, maybe I can see, oh, 7%. Is this person just guessing? Are they really engaging in the questions? Or do they need more help? 
So, you know, as you can see, you know, we have a lot of formative assessment type tools that we've been offering our teachers. We think formative assessment is, is the key to success. And um, one of the things that, you know, we've been using, of course, you know, we, we have Schoology as our learning management system. And um, what we want to do is it's really important for us to, you know, we're, we're very, you know, data driven, we're student driven, but of course, uh, looking back on the data to see where we're at with things, um, you know, we're, we're kind of proud of this little line graph here that we have. Um, this is, you know, August through half the year here. And, you know, as you can see, there's, there's a lot of consistency with our teachers and with using Schoology. And, and what, that was one of the things that, you know, Tracy talked to you about, you know, in the beginning, what was our why from the beginning? When we first started with Parkland Ready 21, we, we established that why, and it was creating a learning management system, you know, kindergarten through 12th grade. And the reason for that was we didn't want to have, you know, Google Classroom out there and Schoology out there, and maybe somebody else is, is dabbling a little bit with Canvas or all these other types of learning management systems, because we wanted our students as they progress from class to class or grade to grade, we wanted them to be able to focus on the content, not focus on learning another platform. We wanted consistency across the board with, you know, with parents, with teachers, and with the students. And as you can see here, you know, we have a, a couple of, you know, little, little um, humps there, dips there. Um, you know, that little um, tip at the uh, top there, that is um, our Wednesdays. Wednesdays are our e-learning days. So you see that we have consistency throughout the week with usage. And, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty proud of our, our statistics here. Feel free to chime in if anybody has anything else. Uh, this one, um, what we like to show here is, you know, we looked at the last 12 weeks of last school year and um, then the first 12 weeks of this school year, as you can see, you know, we've, we've made huge strides. One of the most important things that we saw right in the beginning of, of, of this uh, experience last year was we, we had everyone connected and we were able to pull the statistics from this management system to be able to show that. And what I like to, you know, to show off here on this side of it is, you know, when we start talking about submissions, you know, we go from last year, like 887,000 to in the fall, 1.75 million. And that's just continuously growing because our students are getting more confident with the platform. Our, our teachers are getting more confident plat with the platform and we're seeing the results. And as I said before, with formative assessments being the key to success, we're having teachers now that are implementing a lot of more, uh, a lot more formative assessments into Schoology's platform. And I think, Sam, that reflects the change between emergency e-learning to when we came back around in the fall, talking about uh, focused on rigor, focused on providing students uh, an education that will keep pace with uh, what we uh, expect um, we should be able to accomplish, you know. Um, one, one sort of... Uh, key piece to that is our content. Sam said we want them to focus on the content. Um, and, you know, some of our more advanced teachers may have had a very good set of content already built in Schoology, but we wanted to make sure there was equity there. And one way that we could ensure that is to provide a content library. Uh, our intermediate unit um, has a, a partnership called eLearn21, where they put together Accelerate Education and a few different other uh, courses that were fully put together. But what was kind of neat about what they, they did for us is rather than um, provide them in, in like a generic format or in a platform that was unfamiliar, that um, uniformity of platform being in Schoology was just so important for our folks that they uh, m migrated them into Schoology for us so that we could have this wonderful pantry of fully baked courses that teachers could just pull off the shelf if they were, you know, st stressed out. I don't have all my stuff together. You don't have to worry about that. We're going to clear that for you. Um, and eLearn21 is a really great uh, installation for them. Uh, this, this next bit here, um, Lauren, you want to talk a little bit about how our elementary PLC groups have been going? Sure, and actually um, all levels have PLC groups. We talked about sharing content and also supporting and creating those relationships back from the earlier slides. Not only do we want to create them with our students, but we want our teachers to create those relationships with each other and help each other um, that, that will stabilize everything. So we have PLC groups in every single course and every single grade and teachers can save items in there. They can actually save a whole course, a folder, a unit, um, just a test, whatever. And then those can be shared among other teachers who need them. So very quick ways for people to share great work that they've done. And I think like, you know, a silver lining, we're always looking for some of these silver linings with this whole COVID experience. And one of the things is, you know, Tracy said before, the smartest person in the room is the room. And how do you get teachers and um, your staff members to recognize that, you know, it's, it's not a co competition. 
It's about a collaborative experience. And I think having uh, this experience last spring and, and knowing that teachers were, were scrambling to try to find resources, to try to put all of this, this content together on this online platform, I think it gave them an opportunity also to collaborate more with each other. And now is, you know, with those courses, those groups and things like that, they're sharing out their resources and they're teaming up and they're saying, okay, well, it doesn't make sense for me to create all of these units myself. You, t you create this unit, then you can pick and choose. And, and uh, I think I'm pretty proud of our teacher for you know, what they're doing. Yeah, they see value now in sharing and collaborating. I Absolutely. Agree. Hopefully you can see there's been a lot of change this year. Um, we're going to try to focus on the silver linings from the pandemic. And one of them is that we have accelerated the move to a more learner-centered classroom just by sheer necessity. And so our teachers have embraced this change, embraced these tools, but again, now we're interested in learning some of the things that um, you have done to move the needle towards a more learner-centered classroom in your district. Um, again, if anybody wants to post in the chat, we would uh, certainly appreciate it um, so that we can you know, learn from other districts that might be uh, on this session today. And moving forward, I think we're gonna go on to some of our professional development offerings. Yeah, you know, um having some carved out uh, time over the summer for teachers to sort of just like uh, de-stress and decompress. We, we approached uh, the summer with over 60 academies. Uh, that was your basically one hour session that you, you sign up for for PD hours, um, led by some of our best and brightest uh, teachers that are, that are setting a really great example and sharing their knowledge. So it's peer led. Um, and it is short and focused. That's something we don't really have too many academies that are longer than an hour. I think that's a change that's happened over the pandemic. But you can see how do we recreate that kidney table as like a topic that was on everybody's mind. So I have some best practices shared there. And, um, you know, as we go through the fall, not so many academies in the spring, though, teachers started getting their feet about them and ready to dive in and learn more. And we've been really happy with the attendance we've gotten on our academy catalog this uh, spring session. You know, and that brings us to, you know, the professional development opportunities that we're offering. And, and, you know, Lauren and I hear it from especially at the secondary level and JR at the elementary level, we're hearing that one of the most important things that they, they felt was, was so crucial to this entire experience was the felt, they felt supported. You know, they knew that if they had a question, you know, we were there, you know, during the spring, we were there from, you know, I don't even remember what the exact timing was, but it was like 2.15 to 3.30 or something like that. Every single day, it was a consistent time. And now um, with our Wednesdays being e-learning days, we have the opportunity to meet with our teachers and we offer elementary sessions and secondary sessions. Um, and we're offering them, but also, um, you know, I know Lauren up at the high school and myself at the middle school, we have tech mentors that are creating um, opportunities for teachers to be able to come into their sessions as well. And Lauren, you wanna talk a little bit about our tech mentors? Um, sure, we have uh, tech mentors in each grade level and then um, each subject level at the high school. And those tech mentors are kind of the point people for those subject areas or those grade levels. So that if a teacher has a quick question and um, wants a quick answer, wants to meet with a teacher to see how they're doing something, those teachers are kind of the point persons for that particular department or um, grade level. And then of course they can ask us as well. It's just another way to disseminate information and best practices and things like that. And speaking of best practices, this next slide actually is a, a collaboration of best practices. This one is for um, secondary. And you can see that we kind of got creative with this and used some uh, Bitmojis and had some links in here. On the right-hand side, there's the menu. And those are a lot of our tech mentors there who have created um, some presentations on certain things or programs that teachers might want to dive deeper into. So you can- And th those are like five minutes. Actually, you can actually, if with the slide deck, you can look at any of those videos or, on your own and feel free to share them. But uh, we thought it was important to have like, in addition to that shorter overall academy, have like little bite-sized videos by people within the district sharing those best practices too. And that's what we were able to sort of summarize in those. And I think our um, tech mentors have really been a saving grace for us too, because, you know, we, we are, we're always constantly running around and answering calls and answering emails and stuff, but we can only get to so much. And, 
having, you know, I, I believe we have, uh, Trace, is it correct, 44 across the district at this point now? That's correct. Um, during the pandemic, we doubled the number of tech mentors. Um, tech mentors are really teachers that we pay a stipend. They're some of the most well-respected teachers that we have that also are pretty good with technology. Um, and they stepped up to the plate and really helped us um, do a lot of training during the pandemic. And the videos that we have that are attached to the, the presentation that Lauren, Lauren had up before, um, a lot of those videos, they, as JR said, they're just, you know, two to five minute videos. Feel free to share those out. We have them opened up that they can be viewed by anyone with a link. So feel free if you come across something that, that's of interest to you, feel free to share that out with, with your teachers. And then not to be outdone by the secondary tech mentors, the amount the elementary crew got in. Uh, so November for the secondary elementary in December uh, with their winter wonderland. Same idea, you click on any of the Bitmoji guys and pulls up their videos. These uh, collaboration uh, courses as well um, are, are a place where, you know, so many teachers coming in and out of the district on a moment's notice with, you know, for whatever, reason we have to, hey, um, this sub is now going to be teaching Spanish for half a year. We need to get them up to speed very rapidly. Um, one of the ways we do that is through our collaboration courses. So using modeling our uh, LMS Schoology, uh, there's elementary, middle, and high school resources where we have some of the key tools and how to use them recorded. Uh, we're actually nice enough to be uh, working with uh, the co-founders of uh, apps like uh, Edpuzzle, uh, Kim is uh, doing a session here and then uh, Cami uh, that those those folks have recorded PD session just like everything you would need to get up and running was asynchronous and available when when Lauren Sam or I or Tracy couldn't be um, so that a teacher could sort of like on demand pick up and go through this whole catalog of everything that they need to be successful and to provide an equitable experience and and really not at a disadvantage Sam and Lauren you would I think both say that we have some teachers that have popped in to pinch hit and uh, started doing some really fantastic work very quickly. And I think the collaboration course has played a role in that. Absolutely. And in full transparency here, you know, we, you know, I'm sure your teachers are in the same boat. They wish they had more time uh, to be able to post and explore and, and do all this stuff. And what we're trying to do is, as Tracy said before, clear, if we clear the brush for them on some of these other things, hopefully they'll have more time to, to work in post and, and uh, collaborate with each other. And then one last piece that stitches everything together for us, some very um, essential, uh, uh, but small additions to the hardware that teachers had available to them to make a hybrid classroom possible. And we'll take a look at that. the monitor because I'm allowed to see I can see them I can also see what they will see when I'm projecting up here so it allows me to check to see that make sure that they get all of their work and then it allows me to see them and it also allows me to interact with them through the chat room all at the same time even though they have their dogs <laughs> in the picture at the same time but it allows me to see them like they're actually in my room wanted to bring to mind this little device that gave us this lens clip which I, I think has been very very helpful for for teaching physics because a lot of times in physics we have to do long equations that fill up this three-tier whiteboard system yeah. and just this little device right here actually has some interesting optics inside of it and all you have to do is go ahead and put this right over I'll just pin myself so you can see the difference and then I'll maybe show the recording there. So you can see without it and then with it for the students at home, let's see you line that up. That is a big difference there. And one of the reasons I like using the speaker is because of the option where students who are in class can communicate with those students who are also at home. Um, it's come in beneficial when we've tried to do Socratic seminars um, with their cameras on and the ability to hear everybody else. Um, when you can move the room around to and place the speaker in a very central position, it does make the students feel uh, that they are more closely connected. He would go for it. I think if she told him he needs to see someone, 
he, it would just make it too real for him. Like, I don't think he wanted to do that. What about you think? Well, I think kind of he wouldn't contact Jane because he wants to keep like that sense of like innocence and friendship with her. And I don't think he wants to get to a too serious fun with her. Like, so for a relatively small investment, we were able to really uh, have a big impact and, and make that sort of learning possible. Uh, with this next one, um, and this will be the last video, and then we're, we're going to close out in just a couple minutes here and um, answer any questions you may have. Uh, but for this next one, what you'll see is um, a teacher, you know, utilizing the resources that we've already talked about, but also going into a more personalized approach and taking these resources and being able to when she's personalizing her instruction, how, we, how are you doing that when you have students online and hybrid in front of you? So um, this just sets that up. Hi, I'm Emily DeLuca. I teach sixth grade ELA and social studies at Springhouse. And never could I have imagined that I would be teaching during this type of situation. And I am so grateful that the district provided us with all of these resources and technology to really create a beneficial environment for all students in a really challenging situation. Going into this year, I was really nervous thinking that the kids were going to miss out or they weren't going to get the same experience of a sixth grade ELA class that previous years got. But really having this technology, it made them not miss out on those opportunities. Having the different resources like our big monitors are a game changer. The fact that my kids at home can still participate in the lesson, I can share my screen and I can still see the kids' faces and check in with them while I'm teaching is huge. And things like our external speaker and microphone makes me able to walk around the classroom and interact with students that are here while the kids at home can still hear me loud and clear and they can respond back and forth. Kids at home are interacting with kids here in the classroom. That was another thing I was worried about. The fact that we had all of these different experiences where students would collaborate with each other and work in groups and do a think pair share and I kept thinking I'm gonna have to change so much because they won't get that experience but with resources like breakout rooms and Google Meets now we can have full literature circles where kids are working in partners or working in small groups and we're having a whole group lesson and then I can send them into their breakout rooms and they can talk with their classmates and they're still getting that social piece even though we have some kids that are here at school and then some kids who are at home. And so with that, um, I'm going to pass it back over to Tracy to, to close us out. Um, but those are some of the resources. And as we said before, a lot of the other links in there, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions about any of the other resources that we shared. Thanks, Sam. So um, as you saw, we have, a, we have a lot of technology. But at the end of the day, really, we think the best one-to-one -one device in the classroom is a great teacher. And all of the technologies have really been just to support our teachers and to help them make that shift. And so we do feel, you know, despite this pandemic and despite the challenges that Parkland is uh, situated to be stronger going into next school year and to capitalize on some of these changes that, like we said, you know, we had to make just out of sheer necessity. Um, but we do feel we made pretty good strategic decisions that have built a strong foundation for future growth. So with that, we thank you for your time and we would welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, so this is Leilani back on uh, on uh, screen for you. You guys are awesome. Um, what a great team that you've created over there. And I'm watching for questions. Doug will notify me if we have any pop up. So people that are participating, everybody on the line, um, feel free to throw something in chat or raise your hand so we know to call on you and you can at least say compliments to people if you're not going to ask a question. Um, so here's what I kind of want to know is that it looks to me like, you know, you've been through this metamorphosis as a district, but, um, and Tracy, I know I'm going to have you on my panel tomorrow, so I'm going to get into more stuff than this, but, um, you know, most districts, when they get to the point that you are, they got Nearpath, they got this app, they got that app, people are Google Docsing, they got stuff in the, da, 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 da. the next thing we hear from them is viable curriculum map. So they've now got continuity of operations across the district with expectations of normalcy, like every sixth grade teacher is kind of using the same gob of stuff so they can have some predictive analysis. 
Where are you guys at on that? Are you starting to sort of percolate on that a little bit? Uh, I think that's a great question. I do think everything that we've done is through a systems approach. We're very systemic about um, learning management systems, Schoology, for example. That was a few years ago that we made the decision, Schoology K to 12. And yeah. everything that we do interlaces with those systems. So our student information system locks in with our, our um, learning management system. And all the tools that we choose are locked into our curriculum map. So the process for us is curriculum, then the, the tools, the technology tools that will support that curriculum, and then the hardware last. And, and with everything being online, it doesn't much matter if you have an iPad or a Chromebook, you know, it all connects. Um, but I do think the larger system, uh, like you saw Clever, and we have everything single sign-on, everything cloud-based. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we looked at, if we can just save our teachers three minutes per class, where they don't have to finagle passwords and getting teachers or kids just to connect and get to their apps, three mm -hmm. minutes uh, per class, you know, 20 minutes a day, 40 hours of instructional time over the course of the year. Yeah, three minutes, three minutes, Tracy. I've heard stories of 25 minutes with seven-year-olds. You know, it's, you know, forget it. Maybe you never get them all online, like without a single sign-on. So that's, you know, three minutes would be glorious if you didn't have sign-on. But, you know, having single sign-on is awesome. I, yeah. I would add to, um, it's been really helpful for uh, us not to be in, like at Sam and Lauren especially, want to focus on, the teacher that's like reaching out and saying like, hey, how can I make this lesson a little bit more exciting for my kids rather than shoveling spreadsheets of kids into like the various Nearpods and and, and uh, the yeah. and puzzles and things like that. And yeah. um, Clever and then the, the uh, rostering piece with Clever, uh, especially with our online textbooks, a lot of McGraw-Hill stuff uh, has really, I, I, I think, opened the schedule up for Sam and Lauren to meet with folks too. Yeah, so I want to end off with the, you, you as a whole team, because um, I could ask a million questions, and I started Tracy with that. Going, that I was going to go deeper into that, but I'm I'm, I'm not going to go into that rabbit hole right now today. I'll, maybe I'll go into that with you tomorrow. Um, I, I I really want to ask how you feel, like what happened in terms of the the complexity, the mad dashes, the behind the scenes, midnight calls, and uh, not only with you but with your teachers and your kids. What happened? Tracy, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, not to speak for our teachers, I think that they're exhausted, but they're also pretty proud of what they've accomplished, as they should be, uh, because they did a great job. And how do we know? You, you mentioned data analytics. We did our mid-year dive into data to see where are we, especially compared to a year ago. It was a yeah. year ago that all everything shut down. And first metric that I looked at you know, literacy, because we're very focused on equity, reading by third grade, our kids, you know, going to be able to make that this year. And we were right where we were last year, hybrid or online, it didn't matter. That's amazing. Well, our, that alone, I'm like, okay, you know, yeah. do we have learning gaps? Yes, we do. But they are manageable, and we're focused on them. Um, but I do think the decisions that were made, not just last year, but like 2015, when we mapped out that vision, as yeah. clunky as it was, it did help. And we saw the proof of that this year. So Park of Ready 21 wasn't to prepare us for 2021, but it kind of did. And yeah. like, we're feeling like, okay, it, it did kind of work. Yeah, so you were cool before uh, tech was cool, right? Like you were being tech cool before it was cool. That's, you know, a huge thing. And I, I want to just compliment all of you on each one of you to answer my question too. But, you know, you think about 10, 15 years ago, this, we would have, was learning going to happen across, all across America at anywhere the scale that it has? No. It's like we were all punched and we stood right back up and we're like, okay, we're just going to do it a different way. We're just gonna, like, fine. Right? And everybody just kept going, which is just so amazing. I mean, just dwell on that for a second. I mean, like, wow. Right. It's so amazing. Okay. So JR, what about you? What happened? Um, thanks for recognizing how cool we are. Um, yeah. You know, I was trying to be cool for quite a while there. And I'd walk past teachers in the hall back in like 2018. And they'd say, Oh, hi, JR. How you doing? Nice guy and everything. But boy, they, I mean, like, 
they're good. Like they're good. They don't really want to change things. And like, that's okay. We'll work on it. We'll like take little like baby steps and nobody really has the opportunity to take baby steps come March, 2020. Uh, and then Sam, Sam and Lauren, I'll let you uh, add, but then we were like everybody's best friend. Like we were like the coolest kids in school. It was everybody wanted to hang out with us and uh, ask us how, how to use all of these things. So I, that was, um, how do I feel like I feel uh, like uh, great uh, that we were able to be there for for folks when they needed us. Yeah, yeah, you guys are suddenly, you, you've all got letter jackets now. Um, <laughs> awesome. Okay, so Lauren, how about you? Echoing what uh, JR and Tracy said, as Tracy was talking, I was thinking about an email I got yesterday or the day before from a teacher who said, Lauren, you would be so proud of me. I did a crossword puzzle. I created it. I shared it through breakout rooms. My kids did collaborative work today. I loved it. And I was like, that's awesome. It was just like such a great moment. So we pass around those emails to each other and say, hey, this is for our smile file. Look at something happened as a result of what, you know, what we've been doing. So um, we also bolster each other up as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, tons of magic moments. Well, cool. Well, how about you, Sam? What have you observed? I mean, I think they, they said it best. I mean, it's been quite quite an experience, um, you know, from the beginning. You know, we just, we just wanted to be there for our teachers. And I think what they noticed was such a solid team coming together because, you know, I don't have all the answers. JR doesn't have all the answers, Lauren or Tracy. But collectively, um, you know, we can usually figure out any problem. And I, I know our teachers count on us for that. And they reach out and they don't hesitate. You know, they have us on speed dial. They really do. So I think for a little while in the springtime, I think they really were under the assumption that we were working 24 hours a day because there'd be sometimes we get messages at like two in the morning and we're like, mm-hmm. are you kidding me? Um, but, you know, that just means that they, you know, they trust us. And, and we go back to that original continuum and it's building relationships and trust. And we yeah. established that from the beginning and they knew that they can count on us. And I think having that behind them help them to take chances and, and have a little bit more growth opportunities. And I have teachers, same as Lauren, that you know they, they've come to me and they've said, I didn't even know how to do anything with Google Docs before and integrating this. And now I'm using the grade book and I'm using, so they're very proud of themselves and we are very proud of them as well. Yeah, this has been, everyone went up the mountain at a very steep climb in like a day. It was you know amazing. <laughs> um, so proud of you guys, all of you. And I wanna challenge you to go to the next level and figure out what that is, you know, don't stop because it's not over by a mile. Most people are telling us, most superintendents are saying to us, normal's not coming back. We're going to live in a fractured world forever. How do we perfect it? Mm-hmm. Um, so don't, so, so keep going. And I know you will, cause you're all cool. So there you go. Okay, good. Well, Tracy, I'm going to see you tomorrow. Right. Yes, um, so awesome. Awesome having you. Thank you for letting me uh, talk to this team and, and uh, your superintendent to our thanks to them uh, so that we, we, we got you guys involved and um, carry on. Make sure you take the EduJedi survey this year so you can go a level, right? So you can maybe make it to night level, you know, it's like innovator level, la, la, la. It's going to be awesome. Okay. Because you get like your plastic lightsaber and that's no joke, right? Yeah, Lauren. Now you're now you're speaking JR's language. Watch. Yeah, yeah. I have a plastic lightsaber right here. You have it. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're ready. <laughs> JR, we're speaking our language. Yeah. And, and that's and that's how well we know and that's how well we know each other. So that just does solidify yeah, the fact yeah. that we're a great team. We we know each other. We know what's happening next. That's how geeky we are. <laughs> <laughs> Super awesome. Okay, awesome. We'll carry on. Young children spend 75% of their school day involved in listening activities and need to receive 90 to 100% of information via the spoken word to understand the full meaning. But there are numerous barriers standing in the way of that critical intelligibility. And unfortunately, they can't yet fill in the blanks when things are missed. In students' environments, distance, directionality, and ambient noise all play a role. Speech gets quieter over distance, dropping in volume significantly as it makes its way toward the back of the room. Further, when teachers face away from their students, the sound level can be cut in half. Distracting ambient noise can also drown out speech, leaving students and teachers straining to effectively communicate. And simply increasing the volume of speech itself is often not enough. 
As loudness increases and teachers try to reach the entire room, students might be able to hear what's being said, but they may still struggle to understand it. For example, clarity is critical to the understanding of soft consonants, such as p, h, t, k, s, and more. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has added additional challenges to the listening environment, such as greater distance between students and teachers, masks and other facial coverings, and protective barriers on desks. With instructional audio, you can overcome these challenges. By leveraging a microphone with either a portable or installed speaker solution, you can ensure the teacher's voice achieves even coverage, regardless of distance, directionality, and ambient noise. And with an easy, tap-to-talk microphone, student voices are clearly heard by both their teachers and peers. Instructional audio provides a clear way to hear the human voice and a pathway to elevating the learning and understanding of students in the modern classroom. To learn more, contact Lightspeed today. Okay, so Mary, um, why don't you pop on and introduce yourself? You know, I've enjoyed the relationship that Lightspeed and Learning Council have had and the interactions that we've had with the in-person meetings over the past couple of years. Uh, Lightspeed has always been focused on the listening and learning environment and how we can provide those tools to educators to engage with students and, um, and then the students to engage with their peers as well as the educators. Uh, we have provided microphones, as we saw in, in the video there. Um, but now that we're all wearing masks, we know that just by putting that mask on, we're decreasing the um, sound that is coming from the teacher at least by 12 decibels. And then we're also muffling it, so we're making it unclear. So just by providing microphones um, that are properly worn, we can keep that engagement. We've also looked at the... Um, the synchronous learning so that the students that are in class can hear those students that are remote and the students that are remote can still have access to the in-class conversations because that is critical. We know that peer-to-peer -peer learning is so critical. So as we continue, we, we hear that masks will be continued to be worn even into next school year. Um, and we are here to support teachers and administrators to help find the solutions that are going to continue to make listening and learning in every learning space, not just classrooms, um, success for everybody. Happy to entertain any questions if anyone has, and uh, we'll be following up and providing any information or evaluations for you in your individual districts. Thank you, Leilani, good to see you.